Well, they did. They showed them how they made them. Well, that kept them out of jail. So if they made them all, maybe they did. You know, that's, I don't know. Maybe that's that's not really possible because there's so many of them that there's not enough time in the years that they were supposedly making these things that they could have produced them. And there's a lot of them. There's like 20,000, maybe 40,000 of these stones. <clears throat> so you have to look at all this stuff. You can't just say, well, it's fake or, yes, it's, it's real. you got to look at it and go, well, why can we disprove it? So I've been trying to work on that now in the last 10 years uh, to try and prove they're fakes. So the last time I was in Peru, uh, <clears throat> I we went out to the Nazca Lines, and there was a, a, a road had been paved in there and kind of gravel. So here was a little uh, red quartz gravel just laying there. So I, I picked it up, and uh, uh, when we went in to visit these people who supposedly made them, uh, I handed this lady. She was showing us how she carved them. I said, here, can you carve this one? And she scraped on a couple times and said, no, 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 too hard. Okay, thank you. That one was, was uh, quartz. One of the stones I have molded is also quartz. It's made just like the rest of them. Well, you can't scratch it with a hacksaw blade, and she proved it. So how did it, throw all the rest of them out and say they're all fakes, how did that one get made? It's just like the rest of them. It's, so how have they made these things? Was It wasn't made with a apparently a hacksaw blade. <clears throat> so that was a way to to test the, uh, you know, are they all made by this lady? The artwork wasn't the same either. You know, I'm an artist, so I can judge artwork. And I told the people, I said, this is not the same. Her hand is not the same as what we're seeing in these supposed old ones here. So, <clears throat> but but there again, one of the, some of these, um, these scenes <clears throat> on there, are sauropod dinosaurs, long neck, fat body, long tails. And they're grabbing some of these people by the arm. And they're they're thrashing them around in some cases, throwing the guy up in the air, right? So, okay, uh, why, if they're fake, made in the 60s, back when everybody said herbivores, the long neck dinosaurs were peaceful, only ate leaves, and they never would hurt you. So if that's the dominant theory, that's what they would have shown. They wouldn't have shown a violent one attacking a man unless that's what was being depicted hundreds of years ago. So <clears throat> the people over in the Amazon <laughs> didn't have cell phones back in the, the 50s and 60s. They didn't call the guys up in Peru, which you don't even have running water, on their cell phones, which didn't exist, and go, hey, let's start a hoax here. You know, we're going to tell the story about these things coming to get you, and you guys do some stones over there of, of that very thing. Okay? Never happened. So how, why are they telling the same story? Is it true? It's just what happens? These things were dangerous? Yeah, they're herbivores, but did they attack people? Or were they also meat eaters like horses? So there's a lot of ways to test these things, and I, I guess I just don't care enough about being unpopular or being ridiculed as a, being a, a uh, nut, you know, I'm willing to keep looking at this stuff <clears throat> until I can feel myself that I've proven or disproven it and uh, let people criticize, let them, you know, throw stones. I'd rather I'd r rather be a, uh, a good scientist, a good researcher, and prove or disprove something by hard work than just to take the easy way out and go, oh, yeah, yeah, let's just forget about it. So I, I think the lady's story in Peru in, in the Amazon was true. It corroborates the story, these depictions in, in the Brockus, Peru. So, you know, the problem is you can't have man and dinosaur living together. That's what causes all the problems. So very interesting. And if they live together, well, too bad, you know, too bad. Now, uh, going into, because we were talking about before, you know, going on air, Bigfoot, when you've been out looking at all these bones, have you ever seen anything that resembled like Bigfoot bones going back in prehistoric time or anything like that? No, but uh, Gigantopithecus, which is a giant ape of China, they have found tons of teeth. Where are the heads? Where are the bones? Okay. Uh, this isn't the fossil record. These are supposed to be like millions of years old. 
and they know it's a big ape of some sort. It's almost, you know, their teeth and our teeth are pretty similar, but our teeth are also similar to uh, uh, the front, our front teeth and the front teeth of the giant hyena I've dug up out here. They're so similar, you think they're the same thing, but one's a dog and one's a human. The back teeth to a pig, in many cases, are so similar to a human, they could be mistaken. <clears throat> so, uh, <clears throat> is, is it possible that, that these things ate each other but not the teeth? You know, why would an animal eat a tooth? But they do. I mean, you know, uh, sometimes that's the first thing a cat will eat. A mouse will eat the head. And uh, I found the droppings, of apparent droppings, of um, the bone-eating dog, the big hyena out here in our canyon. Uh, be a clump of little chewed-up bones together. You can see teeth marks on them. And and there'll be chewed-up teeth in there. But the the, uh, the bone-eating dog, the Barophagus diversidens, hyena dot, had a jaw made for, just like they say, crushing bones there. They even have an extra bone on the top of their ascending ramus. It's a separate bone. It, it petrifies differently even. So, yeah, uh, they could break up bones and teeth, and I don't think the tooth would do them any good in their system, but it's easier to just eat the tooth with a jaw, which has something in it, that is to spit the teeth out. But Gigantopithecus, if it's like Bigfoot, apparently Bigfoot ha- has uh, tactile hands and fingers. So if they're eating each other, I know this sounds really gross, if they're eating each other, it's possible they don't eat the teeth. You know, I, but of all the big Bigfoot guys I know, I don't know any of them who said, yeah, we find teeth everywhere. I don't know if they've ever found a tooth, which puts it back into the big question mark. What are they and and what what do we understand from them? Well, you know, on this past show, I kind of got in trouble. I, I, you know, we were talking about Bigfoot, you know, and the scientist was doing his thing. And then the other two people, you know, on the panel were talking about Bigfoot. And, you know, I had an experience where I saw one and it where it literally chased me back, you know, years ago, me and a friend. Now, I, I know what they look like. I know how at least how what that one looked like and what the reaction is. But, you know, they were talking about things like, uh, well, the remains, you know, like, you know, they only have gotten like hair, which, you know, when they do the DNA, it's kind of, it could be bare mixed with something and they don't know what it is so that, you know, it doesn't prove it's Bigfoot. Uh, they have a lot of footprints, but that's pretty much all the evidence other than, you know, <laughs> the knocking sound against trees. Now, the thing is, I made the remark, I said, you know what, I, I really think maybe someday somebody's going to see a Bigfoot and maybe shoot it. And they got really upset. And I said, look, you know, then after they shoot it, they can make up a law then that, hey, if they if the the Bigfoot falls under humanoid, then they can make a law that if you shoot one, you go to prison for murder. I don't know. But I think it's going to take something like that, you know, to actually have the proof that they exist. You know, I can sit there all day long and tell you I saw one, but that's no proof. And, and, you know, footprints, a lot of the footprints, I mean, yeah, the, some of it, I believe, are Bigfoot. Some of them are made by, you know, people that fake it, too. Well, in the conference I went to, there was uh, uh, several really top Bigfooters. Uh, Don Monroe, Ron Moorhead, and yeah, others. Uh, they recorded their sounds. Uh, uh, Don Monroe has plaster cast dozens of their uh, footprints, handprints, knee prints, uh, babies and, and adults, really big ones and medium sized ones. And there's no, I would not argue with that. They're, those are prints of something like a Bigfoot. Uh, <clears throat> another, uh, guy, John Worms, who's written a great book, uh, uh, Creatures Seldom Seen, where he, he, uh, uh, catalogs all these animals, these encrypted animals he's been discovering. Uh, reports about up in Canada, up in Manitoba. He's talked to a lot of American Indians, up, or uh, I guess they call them natives up there. They all know about Bigfoot. They all know about the giant snakes. They all know about the giant beaver and, and all this other stuff, and they're not making any of that stuff up. There was an old gentleman up there that he knew about. The man is like 105, I think, and he knew 
that this guy's story was that he had killed one when he was like 17 or 18. And the story goes, he went to this old fella and he agreed to finally tell the story. And he got it on film with uh, subtitles, everything. It's really beautifully done. <clears throat> and the old gentleman was very polite. Uh, and he tells the story that he was out hunting. And back then, you know, you had to hunt to live. This is in the 20s, I think, 30s, maybe. And he said he saw an elk and shot it. Well, he, it takes off, you know, so he's got to go try and find it now where it dies. So he goes up and he sees it laying there in the bushes and shoots it in the behind again. You know, because it's down, you better shoot him and get him, you know, uh, or he, otherwise he get up and get away from you. So he goes over to it. When he gets there, he's, he's mortified that he's killed this human-like Bigfoot thing. It's not the elk. Because of the bushes, you know, his brown color covered in hair looked just like an elk. And he got there and he realized he had killed this Bigfoot thing. So he took off, never told anybody for a long time, and finally agreed to tell his story. And I think he died uh, in a few weeks ago. So uh, there was, uh, you know, I interviewed a fellow out here who he and his brother shot one 25 times. It was coming at them. He was sort of a white color, may, may have been an old one or something, or maybe some of them were white. Uh, I said, well, do you know, are you sure you, sh you, you hit it? Well, he got mad. He says, me and my brother are dead shots. We didn't miss. I go, well, okay, well, how do you know it didn't die? Well, you know, he hit something 25 times. Yeah, but you know, he hit a lowland gorilla 25 times. He's going to keep going longer than the monkey will. So maybe the thing went back and died back there, and then his buddies ate him. I don't know. It sounds gross. But uh, your question is good. Why don't we find the remains? It's one of the first questions I asked uh, one of the big researchers in 85. Why don't we find the remains? And he said, I think they dispose of their dead. So um, another lady says she knows of a baby that died, a baby Sasquatch that died, and they buried it in... Uh, like sawdust or something they made, leaves or something, and, and, and planted in dirt, planted trees at the end of it. You're going, what, an animal plants trees? Apparently they can. And uh, she said it was the mother was wailing over this, this dead baby, which yeah. presents more problems of, you know, we probably shouldn't shoot them. <laughs> you, know? you know? So are they human? Are they Nephilim? Are they... Angels, uh, are they just an animal or are they just an ape that can make these human-like uh, movements and sounds? I don't know. You know, I know a lot about this stuff, and I'm not all the guys that know about it. They don't themselves know for sure what they are. So if these guys don't, they've been looking at it for 50 years. Who am I to say I know what they are or what they are not? Well, you know, I can tell you a little bit now what we were talking about before we went on the air, and I talk about it maybe too much on my show but, you know, in the, uh, the early 2000s, uh, me and my friend, who was a medical doctor, he just got done doing his internship. Uh, he got funding to, you know, open up a medical practice here, up here. And he was an avid photographer. I was also. I love taking pictures. So we decided to go on a road trip. We wanted to go take pictures of old cemeteries, ghost towns, uh, silver mines up in the Canadian Rockies. So one of the places right. we w wanted to go to was a World War II Japanese internment camp where they used to intern the uh, pr uh, prisoners during World War II. Miles right. and miles from any town. I mean, it was out in right. the middle of nowhere because, hey, that's the best place to put prisoners. They can't get away, you know. And so we, we get up there. We drive the car up a, 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 a access road as far as it went. And then we had a h hike in about two and a half two miles, two and a half miles to it. And we get there, you know, and we're starting to take pictures because there was not much, any remains left of the buildings or anything, but, uh, but there were some, you know, machinery. Cause I guess the prisoners also worked the mine for silver or whatever they did. And there was some equipment over the other side of the Creek there. And, uh, you know, my friend says, Hey, look at that huge bear, Gary. And I, I, you know, I had my camera. He had a wide angle camera taking, you know, wide angle shots. I had a telephoto. I swung around and, you know, to get a picture of the bear. Now, this thing was maybe eight, nine feet.